Dr. Ruth Boti is a board certified family physician and addiction medicine physician who works in Western Mass, Massachusetts. She's medical director for the Franklin County House of Corrections, the director of addiction services for the Behavioral Health Network, and the medical director for the Pioneer Valley Regional School District. She studied at Wesley, Wesley College and did her medical training at Yale and at Boston University. Um, I've asked her to come talk about the, the science behind the brain disease model of addiction to kind of help, help us understand the latest research and in, in what goes on in the brain and how that interacts with addiction. We have her until 1.15 and so she will present and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. And I wanna thank Dr. Poti and turn it over to you. Great, thanks Chris, I appreciate that. So I don't feel, I have never gotten good enough to actually answer questions live on Zoom. I just can't manage it all. So if it's okay, we'll just do the questions at the end. And a real live audience I actually love to be interrupted. I just can't figure out how to do it and not screw things up. All so right. we're, we're gonna spend time talking about the human brain. Um, and this is the organ that is harmed by addiction more than any other organ. The, for the most part, for opiate use disorder, other organs actually are not really touched. The kidneys are fine, the liver is fine, the gut can slow down, the endocrine system gets disrupted when you have an opiate use disorder, but the organ that's most harmed is the brain. So this is where we're gonna spend our time. And I'm gonna make a comment to y'all who are journalists. Um, Journalists run this story. This is the cover of National Geographic uh, 2017. And the level of community knowledge about how addiction is a disease of the brain has really increased. People talk about it this way now. Uh, people who struggle with addiction talk about it this way. And that's, that's a major game changer just in the last 10 years. And that is because there's been great reporting on the subject. Um, it's most people don't think of this as a weakness of character or growing up on the wrong side of the tracks or you just haven't gotten God yet or anything. They understand that the brain gets disrupted with all sorts of addiction. Um, and I, I will tell you, if you want to go back and look at things, this New England Journal, sorry, this National Geographic has great video online. It's a really great article. I'm not promoting this magazine specifically. Um, we're going to simplify because I actually simplify it all for everybody, um, including doctors, because the level of training that you get in medical school or PA school or NP school on the subject is close to nothing. So the part of the brain that is harmed with addiction is the reward circuit of the brain. It is the most ancient elemental part of the brain, and it tells you to survive, to find food, to find water, and to find a mate. The goal of this part of the brain is to survive long enough that you could possibly make a couple generations ahead of you. That is the reward circuit of the brain. And it has been there as long as any organism has been on this planet. It is the eat, drink, and have sex part of the brain. And it is this reward circuit that gets broken with all addiction. The pathways that end up in the reward circuit are complicated, but at the end of the day, it ends up um, with the dopamine receptors deep inside the reward circuit of the brain. Uh, the three areas that are most lit are the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, and the prefrontal cortex. I'm not going to spend time talking about serotonin. I'm going to focus on dopamine. And dopamine has with it associated very strong reward and joy and euphoria. And it is a holy smokes, that was awesome. Do it again, neurotransmitter. That's what it says. So holy smokes, that deer you just killed just gave you sustenance and protein and you can live another day. Do it again. That's the way this part of the brain is designed. Um, it has with it very strong motor function. And so people who smoke will say, the minute I touch the door handle on my car, the minute I get my hand on that steering wheel, I want to smoke. It triggers a tremendous amount of um, craving desire in the brain. People will say, I don't use heroin anymore, but sometimes I inject normal saline because I miss the works. I miss tying off a tourniquet. I miss loading up a syringe. Two behaviors associated with dopamine, compulsion and perseveration. I have to do this thing. I am unable to stop thinking about this thing. And so people get frustrated with people who struggle with substance use disorder. And when I find myself getting frustrated, I take a breath and I remind myself of compulsion and perseveration. It defines the disease. So we all have at a baseline, a certain amount of dopamine every single day in our brain. And I'm gonna make an argument that if we're all sitting at about a hundred units of dopamine, and there's some of us who really feel awesome every day. We are those golden retriever people. We're the people other people turn to when they're feeling down. We're, in, in, we're not the majority, I'll say that much. 
we have high dopamine. Maybe our baseline's 105 or 106. A lot of us though look like this. This is where I live. I don't have super high dopamine. My dopamine actually may be 95 or 97 every day. And I work hard every single day to make my dopamine better. And we all do. In fact, if you're living either a healthy or an unhealthy life, we all tend towards things that make us feel better, whatever that is, right? Exercise, eating a lot of sugar, chocolate, using drugs, drinking alcohol, reaching out to friends, listening to music, whatever it is. And everybody should ask themselves, do a little self inventory about what your jolts of pleasure are during the day that you turn to. You're giving yourself a spike of dopamine. So if we're all sitting on average at 100 units on a day-to-day -day basis and you find the perfect food, you'll get a spike in dopamine to 150 and then it will go back to normal. If you have sex, it's consensual, you have an orgasm, your dopamine will go to 200 and then it will go back to normal. This is the way we are designed as humans. For the 200,000 years that we've been on this planet in this form, this is the way it is supposed to be. We need to be rewarded for surviving, right? We need to be rewarded for creating other generations ahead of us. So this is when things start to go awry. When you start to expose your brain to chemicals that spike dopamine to particularly high levels, the brain starts to get very confused. So when you use cocaine, which is a moderate uh, high stimulant, your dopamine might go to 350. When you use a prescription opiate in volume, maybe it will go to 500. You use heroin or fentanyl, it might be 900 or 1,000 levels of, of a dopamine unit in your brain. Methamphetamine is the most powerful stimulant that we have access to. Um, and you'll get a dopamine spike of 1,300 or higher. So huge levels of dopamine, right? That's crazy. And what's amazing is that more of us don't get up every day and do a hit of meth because that seems like that would be very fun, right? 1300 of dopamine seems like an awesome day is ahead of us. And maybe it is the first time, but this is the problem. When your brain is seeing this spiking levels of dopamine, it says there's something wrong here, right? Throughout all of evolutionary period of time, you're not supposed to have dopamine like that. You need to turn down the volume. So the brain starts to downregulate. It starts to say, there's something wrong here. I need to quiet it down. So let's take a step back and let's remind ourselves how certain drugs work with dopamine. I'm gonna cover two. We could do this with almost anything now. Let's talk about cocaine. There's three things that govern how much dopamine is in your brain. Three things in this equation, how much dopamine is produced, how many dopamine receptors are on the other side of the synaptic cleft receiving the data, and how many little reuptake transporters or vacuums are sucking dopamine out of the synaptic cleft or the active part of the brain. Those are the three things that determine how much dopamine you're experiencing. Cocaine works in one way. It's a very simple mechanism of action. It's the most simple one we have. All it does is it paralyzes the little vacuum. So there's no little vacuum sucking the dopamine out of the synaptic cleft. So you just get this buildup of dopamine active there, okay? So it turns off your Roomba, it paralyzes it. You would think cocaine would be easy to treat because we understand exactly how it works and we know it works in this one spot. We have, as everybody knows, there's no good treatment for cocaine use disorder, at least no pharmaceutical treatment. There's some other behavioral modifications that might help. So what we did is we uh, affected one thing in this equation and we impacted the amount of dopamine in our brain. Opiates are different. Opiates are, opiates are a little more complicated. They go through the mu opiate receptor. They then do a negative feedback loop over the GABA receptor. But at the end of the day, every opiate works in the same way by shoving more dopamine out into the synaptic cleft. Okay. So in both circumstances, we end up with more dopamine in the synaptic cleft. One was by preventing it from being removed. The other was by shoving more out, okay? So outcome is the same, mechanism is different. We've just talked about two of the three things that can happen in the equation. And every drug that's addictive, including sugar, including behavioral addictions, like um, gambling as an example, are impacting this. Now, sometimes it takes 12 steps to get there and I'm not gonna go through every one. I, I think oftentimes they're not even well understood, but at the end of the day, it has to do with how much dopamine is produced in the brain. So when the brain is seeing these dopamine levels of 1300, 900, 350, it says, holy smokes, there's something wrong. This isn't normal. I need to turn down the volume and it stops making dopamine. It erases dopamine receptors. So you don't have 100% of your receptors active. You have half or fewer than half actually receiving information. And it turns on every vacuum in sight. So it's sucking up the dopamine out of the synaptic cleft. 
So when people struggle with addiction, when they wake up in the morning, they're sick. And I'm not just talking about withdrawal symptoms, physiologic withdrawal. They, their dopamine is so low in their brain that it's actually not consistent with survival on the planet. And their brain says, your dopamine's a 45. That's terrible. You're not going to live. Now, you're not aware that the brain is doing this, but it is saying you need to feel better. Do what it takes to feel better. And the only way that people who struggle with addiction know to get better is to continue to use. And the truth is, if everyone on this call right now woke up every day with a dopamine of 45, you too would do whatever it took to get better. And what I find extraordinary, because I'm an addiction doctor, this morning I went up, I went to my methadone clinic, I saw patients there, I went to my detox, I saw patients there. What's amazing to me is that people take a break from this cycle because it's really hard to get out of the cycle and they actually go to seek treatment because for a while, wherever you go to seek treatment, you're going to feel terrible. So to get over this hump, to actually over time, rebuild the structure of the receptors, the, the vacuums and the um, mechanisms that make dopamine in the brain, it takes time, many, many months to a year and a half to restore the brain back to normal. So I just said that I got up this morning and I went to go see these patients and I did do that, but I'm also a family doctor and I do preventive care. Family medicine is not the sexy part of medicine. There will never be a show on TV that's called The Family Doctor because we spend time helping people with their chronic diseases. And I wanna tell a story on this screen. This is a man who lives in the town that you live in. He lives next door and he's 64 years old. And he wakes up this morning at five with crushing substernal chest pain. And his partner looks at him and says, you look terrible, you look gray. And he's like, no, I'm good. It's just like my sandwich I had last night. And his partner says, I'm calling 911. And 911 gets called on this guy, EMS, fire, police. They all show up in his living room and they look at this guy. He looks ashen. He's clearly in significant discomfort. His vital signs look terrible. He's hypoxic. And they say, you're having a massive heart attack. I'm putting EKG leads on you right now. I'm gonna send them to my local hospital so I know which way the ambulance should go. EMS uh, reads this EKG and they say, bypass the local hospital. He needs to go to the big hospital because this guy's gonna need either a cath or a cabbage imminently or he will die. He ends up in uh, the operating room. He ends up with quadruple bypass surgery. He's on the... In, uh, He's in the MICU for a week. He's on the cardiac floor for a week. He gets depressed. He sees the social worker. He gets some meds. He does 12 weeks of cardiac rehab. His life has been saved because he had excellent medical care every step of the way. His next door neighbor is this young woman lying on the floor and she's 24 years old. And when she was 17 years old, she got a soccer scholarship to go to Boston College. And she was a great athlete. And she tore her ACL a couple of times during her collegiate career had multiple surgeries, um, ended up getting uh, unable to play in college, losing her scholarship. And during that time frame, during her period of loss and trauma and grief, she became addicted to prescription opiates. And when her orthopedic surgeon cut her off from the orthopedics, uh, from the prescription opiates, she began to buy um, illicit opiates on the street. And for the last four or five years, she's really struggled with a significant opiate use disorder. Um, for the last nine months, she's been doing great, actually. She found a buprenorphine clinic. She has therapy. She's learning to exercise again in a way that doesn't um, destroy her knees. She just started a job. Things have been really good for her. But this morning, at the same time that this guy's having a massive heart attack, her mom knocks on the door to figure out why she hasn't gotten to work. And there's no answer. And that mom kicks that door in to find her girl lying on the floor. She calls 911 and the police and EMS arrive. They give her... Uh, intranasal naloxone. She takes six hits of naloxone before she comes back. They bring her to the emergency room. And by and large, not much is done for her. Not much is done for her in the emergency room. Not much is done for her in the hospital. She's given a giant shot of shame and blame and your piece of trash. And she's sent home. But I want to tell you about this guy who had the heart attack. He's 64 years old. Both of his parents had significant cardiovascular disease. His mom died of a stroke at 72. His dad had his first heart attack at the age of 56. He smokes a, a pack a day, he used to be a two pack a day smoker, and he kicks back about a 12 pack of beer every night. He loves McDonald's, that's his favorite place. He's limiting his McDonald's because his, his wife gets mad at him, but he's only been going there three times a week. So in a live audience, what I would say is, does this guy have addiction, right? And most everybody's answer is, yeah, this guy struggles with addiction by anybody's measure, right? He's addicted to whatever chemicals in McDonald's food. He is addicted to nicotine. He's addicted to alcohol because a 12 pack a day by anybody's measure is not healthy. And then the next question I would ask is, did this guy cause his heart attack? Did he create his heart disease? And you know what? I told you about his family history. 
But the number one killer in our country is tobacco. The number two killer in our country is lack of exercise and poor diet. And number three is alcohol. So this guy partakes in the three leading causes of death in our nation. And he caused this disease. He created it. And we just spent one quarter of a million dollars saving his life. And the truth is, he's no different than this 24-year-old girl who also nearly died this morning. What's different is they had two different diseases that are seen and treated very differently by the medical community and by society at large. And the truth is, this is one of those times where society is ahead of the medical world because many people have loved ones who they love who struggle with a disease like substance use and they want them to get care. And what I will say as a doctor married to a doctor with a son who's in medical school, medicine takes a long time to change. And um, we have to change how these two people are treated in the medical system because they all struggle, they all created their disease and we need to meet them where they are. So let's go back to dopamine here, okay? So this is a very familiar uh, picture that many people see. These are PET scans through the brain. It's um, a cross section. And what you see in that middle column are people who have healthy dopamine levels. That's that orange in all those columns. And then the column over to your right are people who struggle with a substance. And what you see is there's not a lot of orange. There's not a lot of very active dopamine receptors available there. Um, you know, none of those brains look awesome. The one with alcohol has a little more dopamine. The wheels come off the bus with alcohol use disorder later in the game. There are a lot of us who are functional alcoholics. Um, you're not a functioning um, methamphetamine user for very long, but alcohol wheels come off late. So this is a more complicated slide, but it covers the same kind of topics, which is it's, it's describing in each category, alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, the amount of dopamine available to those who struggle with the disease and those who um, do not struggle. And again, it all has to do with uh, dopamine in the brain. You guys will have these slides because Chris is going to send them to anybody who wants them and he's nodding his head. And the only reason I do this is because this is where you can go back and read things. So of everything I'm going to show you, understanding this article and this graph is really important. When people start, nobody goes into struggling with addiction saying, I want to be an addict because it's awesome. Nobody does it that way, right? People start with, with a dalliance, just trying something out. And not everybody gets addicted, but a lot of people do. And we're going to talk about people who are, who are uh, have a pre-existing situation where getting addicted seems easier. So in the beginning, when people are first using, they just do it in that blue region because it makes them feel joyful and euphoric. And then after a while, it doesn't do that. It just makes them feel good. And then after a while, uh, all they're trying to do is what we call escape dysphoria. They're trying to get their dopamine up to some normal level, I don't know, in 80 so they can function during the day. Then we get into that pink area of the cycle, which is um, when they're not using, they feel reduced energy and they re feel reduced excitement. And then when they're not using, they feel actually terrible, anxious, depressed, restless. They just can't settle their bodies. And that final green cycle is a cycle where I live the, my, most of my time with patients. And that is that they're um, looking forward to using the drug. They need the drug. They cannot stop their brains from obsessing and craving about the drug. And that preoccupation and anticipation cycle can last for years. So I work in a jail where people are incarcerated. 80% of our inmates are there for a substance use disorder. And when people come in, they're not smoking because there's no smoking allowed at any of the um, carceral institutions in the United States. And you can't really get cigarettes. They're really it's not like the old days, there's no cigarettes, but almost everybody who leaves jail returns to smoking. And I don't care how long you've been locked up. You would think if you were locked up for five years, you would officially be a non-smoker. But instead, about six weeks prior to leaving, this part of your brain, the orbital frontal cortex um, in the hippocampus, which governs memory and emotion, kicks in and you start to crave your, your cigarettes. You start thinking about how it is I'm going to get my first pack of cigarettes. Who's picking me up at the curb? What's the tax rate in my state? Am I going to have enough money for my first cigarette? People return to use. It's the reason why being released from the jail is the highest risk time for overdose. This is the origin of that article. It's a great article, Neurobiologic Advances from the Brain Disease Model of Addiction. It's, I think, 2015, maybe, oh, 2016. <clears throat> um, I'm going to fly through this slide. The point of this is that the pathways of all the addiction, sugar, coffee, which can be an addictive substance, alcohol, sex, gambling, whatever it is, they start in a part of the brain, but they end up in the reward circuit. 
This is a slide that um, I'm also going to whip through because I do want to get to questions. This is what was known as the long definition of addiction from the American Society of Addiction Medicine in 2011. And I want to just point out a couple parts of it. And that is that genetics plays a huge role. Having a history of trauma or stressors that overwhelm an individual's coping abilities plays a huge role. Um, having a, pre, a presence of a, an additional psychiatric illness, and then having impaired executive function so that perception, learning, impulse control, compulsivity, and judgment are impaired um, can be a big part of addiction. And, and these are what we think of as some of the potential precursors. This is the short ASAM um, definition of addiction. It's the one they adopted in 2019. Addiction is a treatable chronic medical condition involving complex interactions. You all know how to write and you know how to read. I will not read it to you. Um, but it's a great definition. I live in this world, the four C's of addiction, because I see patients every day. And I sometimes see patients who have been sent to me with the question, have they developed a substance use disorder? Their primary care can't tell. And my job is sometimes to help figure that out. And so for me, if you have some of these C's or even all of them or one of them, you've actually lost control of the drug. So you have compulsive use, you have to use it. You have a loss of control. You have continued use despite harm and you're having cravings to, to use, to drink, to inject, to um, inhale, whatever it is. This is what would define an addiction in my office. Three things set you up for addiction. One is the genetics of it. The second one is early exposure while your brain is developing. And the third is a history of trauma. So having poor mental health does not necessarily mean you'll struggle with addiction. Lots of us have poor mental health and do not struggle with addiction. But what we know is when you have poor mental health, you're more likely to have these other things happen. So if you are a 14 year old trying to survive COVID era misery and you have no friends and you're totally isolated and your life has fallen apart, you may be a kid who has increased anxiety, is not getting their needs met at home all day, all alone with a big brother who introduces them to marijuana or a liquor cabinet that isn't under lock and key. And you become a 14 year old who struggles, who then has early use while their brain is developing. So the genetics are big. Um, when you talk to people who struggle with a substance use, I mean, I always ask the questions, tell me about your family history. Did you, either one of your parents or grandparents struggle with addiction? And almost always the answer is yes. So it accounts for 50% of addiction. If you have both parents, um, it's higher than 50%. Um, can you meet people who don't have genetic risk? Yeah, you can, but it's, first of all, substance use is very common. It's one of the more common diseases we all treat. Um, and it's pretty um, prevalent throughout our society. We think of addiction as being a developmental pediatric disease. It starts while your brain is developing. So if there's people on this call who've struggled with addiction themselves, um, if you can ask yourself the question, how old was I when I first did? And the three common ones, smoked a cigarette, started drinking or using marijuana. Those are the three most common first substances out of the gate. And the average age of first use of one of those three substances is 12, 13, or 14. So it's pretty young. 12, 13, or 14 is a middle schooler. Um, and I think a lot of parents hear that and they think, oh my goodness, not my middle schooler. And I'm telling you, it's pretty prevalent. Our kids are making better decisions than they ever have. But a lot of us worry in this COVID year that decisions are going to be um, veering off course. So what is actually very rare is to meet somebody who says, the first time I used an addictive substance was over the age of 24. That almost never happens, right? It may be that they started using heroin over the age of 24, but they were using a substance, again, alcohol, marijuana, or nicotine, most often in their teenage years. This is a study that just looked at alcohol. And so this is 15 year old kids drinking two drinks a week. So not really even heavy use, but they're 15. They're exposing their brain to two alcoholic beverages a week. 40% of those kids went on to be alcoholics. If you wait till age 21, the rate of alcohol use disorder goes down to 7%, which is lower than the national rates of alcohol use disorder. So it's about postponing use. And when I, when I talk to families, when I talk to school auditoriums of people, I say, look, it's not fair to be opening up your, your hoppy beer in front of your kid and say, don't ever drink, it's gonna kill you. That's not rational talk. What you need to be able to encourage all of our kids to do is to protect their brains, right? Like we spend a lot of time talking about concussion and having required concussion conversations with every athlete. Um, exposing their brain to an addictive substance while it's developing is actually a very high risk behavior that could take them off course for the rest of their lives. 
Uh, this is when you add family history on top of, um, of early use. And the truth is, if you can just postpone your use, even if everything is working against you in your family, genetically speaking, if you can postpone your use till the age of 23 or 24, till closer to when your brain is fully developed, you don't go down to a risk of zero, but you go down to 5%. So you may have started close to 50%. You postpone your use because you're well educated by other family members or the person in your family who struggles. Wait, wait, wait until your brain's fully developed and you get down to a 5% rate of substance use. That's amazing. Why aren't people talking about this? It should be taught in every school. So I'm not going to spend much time because I want to have plenty of time for questions, but having a history of childhood trauma um, or, or adult trauma or what we call an ACE score is a very big predictor of somebody who's going to struggle with a substance use. Um, most of you on the phone or on the call know about an ACE score. I'm not going to spend tons of time on it for that reason. Um, the original article came out, I think, in 1997. Uh, Vince Felitti, who wrote the article, uh, really was looking at the rates of adult massive obesity and childhood sexual trauma, specifically in women. That was the question he went in asking. It was not the answer he found, although there was a very strong correlation between those two things. Instead, what he found is when you ask these 10 questions of an adult, these 10 questions measuring neglect and harm and um, many other things that might have happened to you under the age of 18, if you score greater than a six on the ACE score, on average, you have decreased your life expectancy by 20 years. If you score greater than a three, you're at much higher rates of every chronic disease out there with the exception of diabetes and stroke. This is one of the best predictors we have of who is going to struggle. And I think people read this and think that's crazy. Why would what happened to me when I was a kid have any impact on whether I'm gonna have multiple broken bones or, um, or develop cardiovascular disease? Well, it does. And again and again, if anybody is like, I need to study more up on trauma and ACE scores, this is where you wanna go because this stuff is both fascinating. The amount of public knowledge about it is not particularly high, but this is a huge predictor of who's gonna struggle with a substance. And part of it is because you're escaping pain. And when you wanna numb up and you wanna escape pain and trauma from childhood, from your current situation, drinking and drugging is the fastest, best way to do it. And here's the problem, and you guys know, know this. It's complicated to break your brain and it takes a long time for you to get better. But the treatments we offer most people in this country is a detox, in and out, five to seven days, spin dry cycle, and we expect them to get better. And that's bananas because nobody gets better in these detox situations. How do I know? Because I run detoxes, I know this. What makes you better is time and it takes a long time. So it isn't just a detox, it is get you medically stable in a detox situation maybe get you onto treatment for your substance, whether it's methadone or buprenorphine or naltrexone or something for alcohol, and then move you along a pathway of structured sober living and a lot of support. It takes a year and a half or two years to really get better. It's a long commitment. Um, this is just sort of brain scans. This is that top brain, super healthy brain full of dopamine. This is a cocaine question. That middle row are people who are 10 days abstinent from cocaine. That's nothing, like 10 days is nothing. They, they just fell asleep for the first time. In even 100 days abstinent from cocaine, look how different that bottom row is from that top row. 100 days is three months, that's great. Pat you on the back, you're doing wonderfully, keep it up because it takes a long time to get better. The model that we use for detox is based on alcohol. We know what it takes to help people get through the worst part of alcohol withdrawal so they won't go into DTs and they won't die. And that's really five to seven to nine days at the high end. But for those of us who take care of people with alcohol use, they still feel terrible on day 15 and 25. It's really on day 45 where they're starting to feel normal, but their anxiety is through the roof. They're miserable. So, um, you know, I'm going to, as a family doctor, I'm going to say, nobody walks in my office and I think, oh, I'm going to cure you of your diabetes, your lack of exercise, your um, central ob obesity. I'm going to fix you in five to seven days. In fact, I don't ever think I'm going to fix people, right? That's not my job. My job is to actually encourage people along a healthier lifestyle, a healthier path pathway to hear where they are now and what small steps might it take to help them get better if that's even their goal. It's not my job to set their goals. My job is to hear where they are and make suggestions. It seems pathetic, right? Um, again, Family Doc will never be a TV show because it's not hot and sexy. And this life-saving work that family doctors do is a long game, not a short game. Yet with addiction, we have this expectation that we're supposed to fix people in short order. It doesn't work that way. It's a chronic uh, remitting disease that will come and go over many, many years. Um, and I wanna talk about relapse or return to use because 
people are so judgmental with addiction. I've, I've never lived and worked in a more judgmental world. Um, people are so angry, families are so angry at people who, re who return to use. But when I take a step back and think about it compared to all my other chronic diseases I take care of, the return to use or the relapse or the I'm not taking care of myself rate is about the same. When you ask the average high blood pressure person, how, how often are you do you take your medicine seven days a week? I don't even ask that question. I say, do you take your medicine three or four days a week? And most of them say, yeah, most of the time, right? Half the time they take their medicine the right way. In the addiction world, we'd fire them. We'd say, oh, you're going to, you're going to jail because you're not taking your methadone the right way. Um, asthma is a perfect example. Up to 70% of people with significant asthma don't take their medicine, right, at all. I'll say to them, are you using your preventer inhaler? And they're like, oh, I don't know, what color is that one? I'm like, oh, okay, you're definitely not taking it. So again, if all of us could spend more time sort of putting ourselves with a chronic disease compared to the other chronic diseases out there and, and be a little less um, judgmental about it. What does it take to get better? It takes a lot of things to get better. I live in a world, because I'm a prescriber, where I do rely on medication. I use a lot of, for opiate use, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Uh, but it takes many things to get your life back on track. It takes restoring relationships with people you've really ticked off. It takes having sober housing where you can afford to live and not be living under an underpass. It takes managing your mental health care in, in real ways. Um, for some people, it takes more than a little bit of stuff. It takes a ton of stuff to get better, getting their trauma treatment done, learning to build self-esteem and self-love. That's the last piece of the pie that, that often comes. You guys have read these books. These books are actually written by mostly great journalists. I know that Beth Macy is one of the speakers at the end of, of your programming, but these are all great books on addiction. If you like the stuff on trauma in the realm of hungry ghosts, in the book, The Body Keeps the Score are the two best books on trauma that I know out there. I wanna to get to questions. I'm not gonna talk about my next 20 slides that I threw in there just for the heck of it, but I am gonna say one thing. And that is that in the next two years, I think the hot issue that um, people should be covering as journalists is gonna be methadone. The rules and regulations regarding methadone were written 48 years ago and they have not changed in 48 years. And that is one of the most effective tools we have in our toolbox. And when COVID hit, it blew the top off of methadone because for the first time in history, SAMHSA wrote a letter that said, you know what, the rules are suspended. We don't want people standing in line at a methadone clinic because they're gonna be put in harm's way because of close quarters. So if people want take homes and they seem stable, give them to them. Never in 48 years had there been a change and methadone needs new rules and regulations entirely. And there's a lot of activity on this subject right now. So you should be writing those stories because there's a lot to be covered. So I'm gonna take questions. If anybody does wanna talk about methadone, that's one of my areas of expertise. Okay, so questions in line, we have a, we'll go to Cheryl, then Barbara, then Kathy. So Cheryl first, and then Stephen, then Kyle. Or, or Cheryl, Barbara, Kathy, Stephen, Kyle. And so Cheryl first. Yes, thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. I'm Cheryl Smith from the Texas Metro News. And um, a two-part question. First, when you talk about um, genetics and early use, which would you classify a newborn born to a drug using parent, mother? Um, so that's a great question. So a, a baby born to a mom who has active substance use, whether she's in treatment or not, irrelevant. That is a fetus who was exposed to whatever it was, alcohol, opiates, whatever it is. So the genetics there are really, really working against that person. And the epigenetics of that situation, of the chaos that then ensues at delivery, right, is also playing a role. Um, what we know is that, um, you know, for opiate use disorder, the, the fetus develops actually quite normally. They can have early preterm labor. Some of them are underweight, but really developmentally speaking, the two most harmful drugs during pregnancy are alcohol and cigarettes. That babies exposed to opiates actually do very, very well. We often in Massachusetts, at least, we get them extra developmental support at home, but there's not long-term developmental or physiologic consequences with opiate use exposure. It is much more severe with alcohol use. And you guys know that I think it's point it's supposed to be 0.1% of babies are born with fetal alcohol syndrome. It's very underdiagnosed. It's a very common disorder. Um, but as a doctor who takes care of kids, we miss it all the time because we just don't screen well for it. So I think my answer to that is for the developing fetus, the genetics are going to be the thing working against them the most. 
And that would be a kid that I would spend a lot of time saying, look, you are a kid who has to postpone as long as possible. Okay, and then um, for those who, uh, you mentioned cocaine use, that it being like a year and a half to detox or, so what about a baby that is born with, um, from a mother or father who used cocaine? but usually they're let out of the hospital like after like 30 days. Right, so what I didn't, I didn't mean to say it's cocaine, that's a year and a half. Most substances take about a year and a half to get better. Methamphetamine, most of us would say would take three years. So here's the difference with a brand new developing infant. Their brain is so incredibly plastic and changing so dramatically in that first year of life um, that they are making new receptors and new connections literally every second of every day. And so when we score a baby at the hospital for exposure to opiates, we use something called the neonatal abstinence score, the NAS score. And most babies really are, first of all, half of babies, even exposed, don't have any withdrawal whatsoever, half. Half of them are fine. And then that half that do have signs of withdrawal, we treat them with medicine. And the average length of stay for those babies is between seven days and 30 days, depending on what they were exposed to. So not every baby who's exposed actually struggles and those babies get better fast because their brains are growing and changing so quickly. And so those are really great questions and um, I gave you sort of simple answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up, Barbara. Yes, um, Barbara Moore, CNBC station in Providence, Rhode Island. I have a two part question as well. I appreciated um, the analogy you made between um, somebody with self-inflicted heart disease and birth addiction, um, having a mother who died from an overdose. Um, how do you change perception out there? We, like you said, we spend all of this money on somebody who has been drinking all these years and has a history of heart disease, um, going for surgery, they're fixed, but yet yeah, the 24 year old lying on the floor and is treated like crap. Well, you know who changes people's perception? It's people like you. It's people who write about the subject and talk about the subject on the radio and the TV. You guys change the perception. Because one thing is to treat these two humans like human beings and not one like a piece of trash, which is how it really goes. Part of it, quite honestly, is some of those drugs that he was using, alcohol and cigarettes, are legal. And the drugs she was using are not legal. And um, the truth is, again, the number one killer in our country is the very legal tobacco. Number three, the very legal alcohol. That's a public policy response from us. So if we can just acknowledge that that's the black and white of that and that if, you know smoking doesn't lock you up in jail but using opiates does lock you up in jail. So I just think acknowledging sort of that and saying that doesn't seem quite right. That, that one slide that I spent so much time on of that man and that woman. I find that when we talk about that slide, people's minds get changed. They see it differently. And they feel the way you do, Barbara, which is they say, it's not fair that that 24 year old didn't get any help. She was actually great, you guys. She was doing perfectly, which is so normal. She had one return to use and overdose. That's so common. You know what she needed? She didn't need any medicine. She needed a giant pat on the back and somebody saying, I hear how great you've been. My understanding is you just got a job and it could be that you're not ready to manage your own money right now. She needed a nurse to say those words. Can I call your mom and can we get a plan to how to manage your money? That's it, that's the intervention, it didn't happen. Uh, and the second question is, I'm sure you're familiar with our MAT program um, in our state um, correctional facility um, in partnership with Kodak. Um, it's, it appears to be doing very well. I talked to Dr. G. Rich, you may be familiar with him a lot. Why is this not replicated in more prisons? Um, to help people not to go back to their use disorder when they are released. So for those of you who don't, Barbara's at, in Rhode Island and Rhode Island is that brave little tiny fabulous state where for the last four years, they've had all, four, all three evidence-based medicines for opiate use disorder in their facilities. And they just did it because it's not even complicated. One day, I think the governor just said, let's do it. And they have these unbelievably smart public health people who made it happen. Um, 
So her question is excellent. Why isn't this happening? Now, it will. In 10 years' time, it will have happened everywhere because every jail out there at the federal, state, and county level is being sued or has been sued. And every single court case is decided in favor of the plaintiff because our job, and you're, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a prison doctor, my job is to provide the same level of care on the inside as, I, as they get on the outside. So how is it that this isn't happening? Well, I'll be honest. Part of the reason is the federal regulations regarding the... Um, management of methadone are so challenging. So my little tiny county jail in Western Mass went down to Rhode Island. We took our field trip four years ago and we said, tell us how you're doing it. And they told us, and we said, fine, we will do it. And we became our own methadone clinic. So in your case, an outside methadone clinic comes in and brings the medication. I live in a place where I don't have access to that. So we became our own methadone clinic and we can't find another case in the entire country where that happened. It took me over a year and it remains the hardest thing I've ever done. I've had babies. I went to medical school. I've run multiple marathons. This was the hardest thing I ever did, which was to help people get better because the federal regulations are absurd. Is it a success? Is it a success? In your, yeah, in your prison. In oh, yeah, jail. it's great. I mean, we have the same numbers Kodak has. Reduced recidivism, reduced rates of overdose. P prisoners are happier. Our rate of drugs behind the walls is close to zero. Every now and then somebody gets some cocaine in and we get mad at them, but there's no overdoses. People are great. People are much better. The, the correctional officers are happier because it's really hard to take care of miserable, sick, violent um, inmates because they're, they're miserable because they're so sick, right? And so when you're actually able to treat them, it's a game changer. But um, it needs to be legislated, it needs to be funded. And then again, the rules have got to be down-regulated to allow it to come in. Okay, next question to Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Ritchie from KJZZ. I really appreciate your talk, thank you so much. Um, I really wanted to get your take on like programs like AA, you know, when you were talking about, sorry, my cat's really loud in the background, compulsive use. Um, I was thinking of the big book and, you know, allergy of the body, obs obsession of the mind, I think. And then also your thoughts on like Al-Anon programs, because a lot of times I've heard people who are in AA, they'll go to Al-Anon, they're, you know, the double winners and they'll do both programs because I've heard Al-Anon sort of just as the that trauma that you spoke of, as well as like family members and how that sort of that genetics, I mean, maybe a person isn't necessarily an alcoholic, but they have certain behaviors. So I just want to get your take on that particular program, because I've heard that there's, you know, I, I recall reading something, I think it was in the Atlantic talking about how it doesn't really work. Um, but I don't know, I'm curious. And I'm still learning about this subject. So I appreciate your patience and, and uh, yeah, no, education. Kat, you actually, what you just said, I was like, oh, she knows more than I do. I get quizzed on actually the 12 steps when I sit for my addiction boards. And it's actually the section I do the worst on because I have a hard time keeping track of them. So this is what I will say is that um, I think for the people for whom anything works, AA, Al-Anon, Smart Recovery, whatever it is that helps you get better, I don't care what it is. If it helps you on the path of recovery, you should do it. What bothers me about very traditional AA is that it's very narrow-minded, quite honestly. There's a the majority of AAs believe you're not sober if you're using buprenorphine or a camprosate or methadone. And it's very judgmental. And that really troubles me because I don't judge people who take their lisinopril every day. You know, could they stop their high blood pressure medicine if they stopped all sodium, exercised 90 minutes every day, stopped smoking, blah, blah, blah. There's 10 things you can do to fix your blood pressure on your own. But every one of those 10 things is actually really hard to do. And we don't say to people, oh, we're not going to help you, right? We're going to instead give you this medicine. But I find the AA model very rigid and very restrictive. Having said that, for people who get benefit from those meetings, I love when they go, I super support it. I think Al-Anon can be so beneficial to families. And so I don't have a hard line. My attitude is what I started off with. Whatever it takes for you to get better, please do it. And um, what you're referencing is actually a really good article from The Atlantic that said, what's the data on AA? Like, show me the studies. And what it shows is that AA has not been well studied until very recently. So a very recent article, and I can't remember the journal, was published saying, let's look at the success rates with AA. And the truth is, for people who attend AA, it's very successful. But there's a whole lot of people who don't attend AA. And for those people, it's not so successful. So you, to do a real study, you need to bring all the people in, the people who don't like it, get triggered by it, 
hate hearing other people's story, have a panic attack when in the room. You need to see what their benefit is, right? If I, if I only had the people in the room who I know are gonna do well in my Cinepril, then everybody does well in my Cinepril. So um, two, there's, there has been a better study that is pretty supportive. But again, as long as they're open-minded, they're open-minded, I will remain open-minded about it. But I think it's a great question. And again, you know a lot about, um, you know a lot about the steps and it is good to, to read about it. Thank you. And I just lost quick, quick question about functioning alcoholics, because I know we've been talking a lot about opioids and methamphetamines and fentanyl, but you'd mentioned you touched briefly on functioning alcoholics. And I was just curious if you had a sense of like, what is the percentage of, of Americans who are functioning alcoholics? Yeah, because I mean, it's legal. So and it's, 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 a, it's a problem right. for a lot of people. It's a lot. And this year it got to be a bigger problem for a lot of people. I don't I mean, again, everybody can do their internal survey of how much more we're all drinking. But I have friends who run liquor stores and they said when COVID hit, it was like every day was Super Bowl Sunday, right? Their lines were out the liquor stores, nobody closed down. And we didn't want them to close because alcoholics would have gone into withdrawal. So we advocated, at least keep them open because we can't handle COVID plus all the withdrawal that will be coming our way. Um, so the statistics on alcohol use disorder is between eight and 9% nationwide. Those are people who are acknowledged to be people who struggle. But the definition of alcohol use disorder is, you know, every day you get home from work and even though you know you shouldn't be having two or three or four of whatever, you still do, right? You continue to use even though you're gaining weight, you're passing out at night before you and your wife have had a conversation, people in your family are getting mad at you. Like there's a variety of things where you really know I probably lost control over this drug. It's causing me harm. The limits on alcohol are really very clear. No more than seven drinks a week for a woman, no more than 14 for a guy. And again, the limit on a day is one or two, depending on your gender. And there's no health benefit to alcohol. The, the old data on there's health benefit to it, that's gone out the window, right? Those are all funded by the liquor industry. Um, the cardiovascular improvement is something like 28%. But again, if we all exercised and stopped smoking, the improvement would be much bigger. So, um, again, these are other stories that people should be writing. What did COVID do to all the substance use? But I think most of us think alcohol use has gone up. And I can say, again, I, I just left my detox this morning and I literally have a line out the door of people desperate to come in. People we've never seen before. I live in a rural area. So, so often I know all the frequent flyers, I see them, but walking in, in the since in the last two months, we have people never known to us before living in our community who say, wow, I've now developed this new problem. Um, just in the last year, I was all alone, sitting on my couch, liquor store was open, I felt terrible. This is the one thing that relieved my misery. And I get it, I totally understand it. All right, Thank next up so is uh, Stephen. Hi, thank you. Um, I write for Modern Healthcare Magazine. Um, I had a question regarding methadone um, and actually buprenorphine. Um, I was curious, what do you think, um, uh, what do you think is needed to uh, make these kind of the flexibilities that we've seen in terms of the rules um, over the pandemic uh, more permanent? And are you concerned that if we go, if regulations go back to where they were pre-pandemic, what kind of an impact do you think that might have on terms of uh, ability to treat? Yeah. So Stephen, the, the, the rule I mentioned was the take home bottles. That's the one that was lifted so rapidly, but there were other rules that changed. So here's, I'm gonna give you just a little spectrum of some of the rules. It used to be the case for buprenorphine. You had to see the person live in person. I had to be sitting with you in your study to talk to you about your first prescription for bup. Um, I had to lay hands on you, maybe, maybe not, but didn't matter, it had to be in person. Once the pandemic hit, they changed that rule, they got rid of it, which meant I could call you on the phone, hear your trouble, and I could send in a script for buprenorphine. I could do it through video or on the phone. That was a game changer because there are many states and many counties in the country where there's no bupe provider at all. And you it's impossible to get to a place. So this was a life-saving alteration. And it meant that telehealth could be used outside of your state. So that has not been written permanently. So if that one gets taken away, it's gonna be a big problem for accessing care. Um, we have patients in my methadone world who have said the following words, I don't want the pandemic to end. I don't want everybody to get the vaccine because if that happens, my life will get worse because my life has been better under COVID. That's crazy. When you hear that, you're, then what you have to think is whatever that former life was with methadone was, wasn't working. And so for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with methadone clinics, you have to show up every single day 
for months on end. You have to be there in 90 days before you get one take home bottle a week. So if you can imagine driving to a clinic, standing in line for an hour, an hour and a half, um, and then going to work every single day, seven days a week, like it is, it disrupts everything. It disrupts your ability to have a job, to take care of your kids. It's, it was a big problem. And why was that rule in place? Well, because the rules were written in 1973 during the, the Nixon era. And it was a very, I mean, I have a whole history of method on why it's written that way. And I'll be honest, I really think a lot of it is based in racism, right? That this is the brown people's drug and the buprenorphine rules that got relaxed in 2001 sort of became the white person's drug. And if there's a racial justice component to substance use disorder, for me, it's methadone. And that's why in Canada, what they did is they got rid of all the federal rules. They said, you know what? There are different problems in different provinces in Canada. And those individual provinces need to figure out their solution. We're going to get out of the way as a federal government. And that's not what's happened in this country. And in Canada, you can get methadone in a hospital or in a jail or at your pharmacy. It can get delivered to your house or you can go to a methadone clinic. There's a variety of ways to do it. In the UK, you start off at a methadone clinic, you get to a stable dose, and then it gets handed to your GP to manage. And your GP writes the prescription and you fill it at a pharmacy. I write for methadone in my primary care office for pain. And you could take my paper script, Steve could walk it down to CVS and a pharmacist will remove methadone from a shelf and dispense it in a bottle and hand it to you for a month, right? What's the difference between those two things? One's the disease of addiction, the other's the disease of pain. Same drug, same chemical, everything's the same. It's about the stigmatization of the disease. Again, I could talk for an hour on that subject. And Chris, anytime, another time, if you want me to talk about methadone, I really feel like it is the most, in I think it's the most interesting story out there because if well managed, it could blow the top off this thing. And we can actually get people who need treatment, the right treatment without destroying their lives. We'll go to Kyle next. Thanks for making time, doctor. Um, wanted to ask you quickly, just for a clarification, if, if you see a substantial difference in efficacy between methadone and some of the other medication assisted treatments. And then the, the big question I have for you is you talked about meeting folks where they are. Curious where you stand on safe injection sites or even decriminalization as, as some states have gone forward with when it comes to opiates. There's no tight answer for you, my friend, Kyle. So <laughs> let me do the first one first. You know, in the old days, we used to say that both methadone and buprenorphine were about 50 to 60% effective. And in effective, there was like pure, like not using, not even harm reduction. Once you put harm reduction, as I'm not using hundred bags a day, I'm down to 10, which means they're much less likely to die. The efficacy rates are like 80 to 90% or even higher, right? So again, 50 to 60% efficacy of being perfect. These days though, because of the fentanyl that's out there, and I'm talking to you from Massachusetts where our fentanyl problem has been severe for the last four or five years, we're finding it harder to get people stable on buprenorphine because the fentanyl is so potent. Um, and people, it's very hard to go from fentanyl use to buprenorphine without having precipitated withdrawal. It gets triggered for a much longer period of time. So we're using a lot more methadone than we used to because we don't have a choice right now. And that's because the drug supply and the drug intensity has altered so much. So that's one tight answer. I absolutely believe in, in injection sites that are safe and where people can not get sick with HIV and hep C and where if they overdose accidentally, someone's there to save their lives. It's, it's crazy to me that we don't have that. And what we know is when people are engaged with loving, caring people around them, they're much more likely to wanna actually get better and stable and go into treatment. That's what we know. We're not encouraging use, we're encouraging the first step it takes to get better in treatment. Um, you heard me say earlier, the difference between that white guy and that white woman is that one drug set of drugs was legal and one wasn't, right? And um, I know that we would have a safer supply out there if it was not coming contaminated right now from Mexico and India and China. And, I, and again, I deal with overdoses almost every single day. I can't tell you how many of my patients have died of a fentanyl overdose. And I do wish we had better control of the supply. Stopping the supply, I, I actually don't see that often working, right? It's gonna be a very hard thing to stop. But if we were able to guarantee a safe supply of drugs that people could use while they're trying to get better, we'd have much better health outcomes. All right, next up, uh, Madeline. Hi, I'm Madeline Beckham with the Mountain West News Bureau. I report for NPR stations in the Intermountain West. I just wanted to ask, um, is there, much of a defined difference or much research on the dip, the risks and treatment availabilities in rural areas versus urban areas. 
uh, especially when it comes to, I don't know, like reservations like we have here in the Mountain West, um, just far as availability for treatment. And is that an increased risk, decreased risk? Is there any hard, fast evidence? Um, I'm gonna talk and I'm gonna share a screen if it's okay, just to show you a map for one second, if you guys don't mind me doing that, hold on. This is a map of methadone clinics in the US. And I, I see where you are in Colorado, but not exactly where you live, but look all around you. There's nothing there, right? And so it, access to treatment is so much worse in a rural area. It is so much worse. And in those areas in the Northeast that look like it's all blue, because there must be a methadone clinic everywhere. Well, you guys know, we have a lot of population out here. From where I live, it's, um, uh, or excuse me, from where I grew up, it's a 45 minute drive to a methadone clinic, which is a big deal. That's an hour and a half every day. And then you got to wait in line. You don't have a job at that point, right? So look at this map, look where you live, look at Garland, Texas, and ask yourself, how far are my people when they don't have a license, they don't have a car that works, they don't have money for a gas, a tank of gas, it is a problem. So that's methadone. Let me get out of this for a second. Um, and then buprenorphine, I have another map, not in this slide deck, that looks at every county in the country that doesn't have a bup prescriber. And it's all in your world, right? It's all over the place where you cannot find somebody. And that's why this COVID era rule that you could talk to somebody on the phone, even from another state who could help get you treatment, that's a game changer. It's got to stay in place. So Madeline, you need to do um, some of the journalistic work to figure out what, are the outcomes worse? Because what you would see is you would see lower rates of participation in stabilizing treatment and higher rates of death. That's what you would see in rural areas. If methadone was available in a community health center, it would be the game changer, right? That's, that's one federal change that could be made that would change it for everybody. Thank you. And, and it just your map shows Wyoming doesn't have a single one. Yep, that is the case. There's some states that limit the number. Wyoming appears to have nothing on that map. And again, when Chris sends this out to you, because I'm scared to share my screen again, but you'll stare at that map again, okay? And there's, and there's 20 more slides that just focus on methadone. I'm giving a talk at ASAM actually, where a lot of these slides are there. So if you guys are logged into the ASAM conference, my talk's Friday the 23rd, and I actually go into detail. What I really talk about is, how, how long, how hard it was to get methadone into a jail. And then I talk about the national changes that need to happen. Okay, we got a question from uh, Alva Amon. Hi, I'm Alva Amon, uh, French. I am a video journalist. And I'm just curious, uh, since you mentioned methadone clinics, uh, Dr. Poti, I'm just wondering how exactly from the outside world do you actually identify what a methadone clinic looks like and how do you actually get access in a methadone clinic to actually film and shoot video? Um, I've tried this in the past and it's just sort of like, it feels like a dead end. And I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions in terms of getting access to film. Um, yeah, as I, th I think it's gonna be hard because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a healthcare providing place, the HIPAA site, right? And so everybody there is a real patient and they're standing outside and you would, if let's pretend you wanted to film patients at a hospital, you would have to get permission from everybody at the hospital and communications department to do it. And they would limit who you could do and you would have to have people sign documents. And it should be the same way to methadone clinic. These are patients who are there for help. So, I, but I imagine people will fight back against you. The majority of methadone clinics in the nation are run by for-profit companies. They make a lot of money. And in fact, the background on many of these companies is they're actually owned by investment banks. When you look at the sales of methadone clinics, and you guys can do the research on this, there's some big names nationwide. And who owns them in the real background is a giant investment bank who really owns them because they're money-making things. Um, and they, I, I can tell you, they're not going to let you in. But having said that, I can't, I, where are you from? What state? I live in New York. Oh, so New, New York is an example of a state, though, that actually has some government run, city run and, and um, not for profit methadone clinics. I think they would be more likely to have you allowed to have access to talk to patients. It would be a great interview to be like, hey, what's your life been like this year? Has it been better for you or worse for you? What changed for you from last year? Because I tell you, methadone folks, that silver lining of COVID was a thick silver lining for them. Okay, next question, uh, Lisa. I most of my uh, questions have been answered at this point, but I did want to clarify any changes that would be made um, for methadone that would come from the national at the national level. Almost all of them are national, actually. Most of the changes are national, so. Take home bottles is a big one. So again, it, um, 
it takes 90 days of having been in a clinic to get your first take home. To get a full month's worth of take homes, you need to have been in a clinic for two years. When they sent this blanket emergency order to every methadone clinic, they said, give anybody you want two weeks or four weeks. We don't care. Just get them out of your clinic. Overnight, this happened. And again, what, what people might say to you, well, everybody must have overdosed on methadone. Kids must have ingested methadone. Animals ingested methadone and died. But really, none of that happened. Like, again, I haven't, it's only been a year. We've been so busy managing COVID that sort of the public health entities that should be researching what happened during this year when the doors opened, it hasn't been enacted. But the states are getting a lot of money right now, right? And COVID pre, please, is going to get better. This would be a really good time to look at, do the data collection on what happened in your state, in New York state, when they blew off the doors on methadone, were people harmed? And if they weren't harmed, and in fact, more people stayed in treatment, more people were able to stay in treatment and take care of their kids who are learning on Zoom at home and go to work, you have improved people's lives, right? It isn't just about overdose or number of people in your clinic. It's about, are people's lives better? How do you get to those questions? That I think would be some great research and, and articles to be written. I don't Are think you I answered okay? your question though. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah you did. Thanks. Uh, uh, Georgia. Hi, thank you very much for your time. Um, I had a question about uh, methamphetamine. Um, you said it uh, takes three years to get better from meth. What does getting better mean and why does it take so long? Is that because of... Um, a huge increase in dopamine or? or yeah, I, I would say it's just the most harmful toxin to the brain is, is how I would think of it. It's just I'm sorry, so it's the what? most harmful of, of that group of illicit, illicit substances that are used. It is so damaging. It, it really breaks everything. So remember I said, I described cocaine as sort of a moderate stimulant and, uh, but methamphetamine is a super potent one. And as everybody knows, it's just gotten more potent as time has passed. So I, I would say my experience with, meth, with methamphetamine is just from talking to patients that it took that long for them to have like no cravings, like three or even more years. I've taken care of people who have a methamphetamine problem for whom normal psych meds do not work, normal doses of psych meds. So I've had people, an example is uh, fluoxetine, which is Prozac, a normal dose, a normal range for that drug is 20 to 40 milligrams for most people. I've had people with a methamphetamine use disorder, they're not using anymore, but they're on 120 milligrams before they feel any impact. So their brain chemistry, their receptors has been so altered. And this is just known that you just sort of, pharmacists will call me and say, did you mean to write for this dose? And I'm like, yeah, I actually meant to write for that dose because this person needs that dose. So it's just really damaging. When you say it's the most important or the most um, um, potent stimulant, do you mean the potent stimulant in terms of dopamine production or do you mean in that drug class of stimulant? In that drug class. That's okay. the drug class that falls in is as a stimulant. Yep. And okay. there's no good treatment for it. That's the other thing. I mean, like, it's really hard to, there was an article that came out in the New England Journal maybe a month ago on using a couple pretty common medicines and the, the number needed to treat was 10 to get one person better. So that's, those aren't great numbers. Those are pretty low. I mean, I could throw a sugar pill at somebody and maybe get as good numbers. So we remain, the best treatment for all the addictions falls in the opiate side. A lot of the other uh, substance use disorders aren't easily treated and stimulants are the hardest ones. And so I'm gonna say cocaine and methamphetamine. Contingency management, which is where you get some, some carrots for doing well. Um, you sometimes get gift cards or payment. Contingency management as a behavioral health intervention is the best treatment we have for stimulant use. And programs that do that do a good job. There's some jails that do, um, or my jail does it, other jails too, that will do contingency management as part of the behavioral health modification. And so in terms of dopamine, um, meth is more, um, more potent than uh, fentanyl even? Well, remember they work in different ways. They impact right. the, the, um, the dopamine equation differently. Yeah, but remember that, that slide, that cartoon slide I showed you of how, what the spike is? Yeah, methamphetamine is, will release a higher spike of dopamine than the fentanyl, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, two final questions, uh, Andrea and then Camelot. Hi, I'm Andrea. I um, work at NPR. I edit this beat. I'm curious as to, I assume you are seeing uh, more patients who have sort of multiple addictions, cocaine and fentanyl, methamphetamine and fentanyl, something like that. And I'm curious as to how that changes how you help that person. 
Um, I don't know if I'm seeing more. It's just so common. It's been that way always. That it's rare I have somebody who has one drug of use. It's, that's uncommon. Instead, it's what you said. It's multiple things at, at once because one brings you up and one brings you down. So you use them together and everybody's doing their own cocktail at home, right? It is a complicated cocktail and it involves often benzodiazepines that are prescribed or purchased. And um, and it, pers- it, it also it involves some of the treatment. So people will be on what you just said, plus they'll do some suboxone on some days or some methadone that they got from somebody else. Like it's pretty crazy the chemistry that people will do to make themselves feel okay. Um, so I see it about the same amount. And I, what I say to people is we used to say, get the worst drug out of your system first, and then we'll work on the other ones. And now we don't say that anymore. We say they're all pretty, pretty bad for you. And the sooner we can get you away from all of them, including nicotine, the more likely you are to get stable. When you stop smoking cigarettes, your craving for alcohol is reduced by 25%, which doesn't seem like a big number, but 25% is about the efficacy of any of the drugs we use for alcohol use disorder. So what if I took somebody and I gave them naltrexone for alcohol use disorder and they stopped smoking? Well, I just got them to 50% reduction. So Instead, what I do is I talk, how can I, how can I get you less addicted to everything, including sugar? You know, like it's all, we're all addicted to something if we're going to be honest with ourselves and how do, how can I reduce you? So I spend a lot of my time on nicotine with my methadone patients. I will say to you that so often cocaine and opiates are, um, they hang together. One brings you up, one brings you down and you use them that way that if you can get one under control, the other one will often go to what go away. Um, the other thing is that there's an incentive of not using alcohol when you're on methadone. We breathalyze everybody because there's a significant overdose rate with alcohol plus methadone. Mm-hmm. And so if you blow positive because you had a beer last night at dinner, you won't get dosed. So there's this incentive not to drink. So we come at it a variety of ways. It's not easy. This is like all the chronic disease we take care of. Uh, Addiction is one of the hardest ones to manage. But you know what? I take care of people with bad diabetes and it's not easy to manage either. Thank you. Last question to Kamala. Hi, I'm Kamala Todd. I'm a reporter for America Fellow and I work at Spectrum News covering mental and behavioral health um, in upstate New York. One of my questions as a family um, practitioner, when you look at children who are, you know, um, the daughters or sons of addicts, you see that they have higher rates of being involved in the child welfare system, higher rates of ACEs, um, and oftentimes addiction issues themselves, how much of that is based in policies that haven't changed since the war on drugs and, you know, the mixture of environment and hereditary? Yeah, it sounds to me like you already know your own answer. It's it's so complicated. I make it seem simple. It's not simple. It's complicated. And, and the, poli- the war on drugs, we need to actually, I mean, here I am spending my time talking about the policy on methadone, but the policy on methadone was, was built on the foundation, the compost of the war on drugs. And um, you know, we could know, we can predict as a society what kids are most likely to struggle. We could predict, and then what we could do is not shame them and make them feel terrible. We can actually pour tons of resources into them, right? We can acknowledge that they come from generations of trauma. Like, we all know this. We all know these families. I grew up in one of the poorest parts of Massachusetts with the highest ACE score, childhood pregnancy, um, sexual assault. It was just known. The whole state knows my, my region. And yet, you know, we have the fewest amount of resources coming to us. Public policy could change everything for so many people if it was well-funded. So you guys know that. You're so smart. So that's it for today, Dr. Poti. Thank you very much. Fellows, thanks for all your great questions, and I will see you in two days.